It's time to babble the fuck on. Live from the John Lovitz Podcast Theater, it's Hollywood Babylon. With your hosts, Kevin Smith and Ralph Garman. Thank you, guys. Fuck, it is Saturday night here in Hollywood, so let's... Let's babble the fuck on. I'm Kevin Smith. I'm Ralph Garman. Huh. I'm glad I came here tonight. Yeah. Uh, you guys are in for such a disappointment. <laughs> Thanks for being here, man. Before we go, let me tell you a quick story. Last week, I feel good. Last time I was up here, I didn't sit in the chair because I was like, I'm too fucking fat. Right. Um, I can't, for, 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 thank you. For vacation... <laughs> Uh, for, for Christmas, I gave my wife a vacation. I said, we're going to go to Canyon Ranch. Oh, that's right. You went to the spa, right? In Arizona. Yeah. It was a spa and shit. And so I went and I ate healthy for a few days and I was exercising a bunch. So I lost enough to fit in the fucking chair. Good. But, thank you. but my point is this. I flew out there on a tiny ass plane. I had a big ass bag. Oh, here we go again. You know I have problems with planes to begin with. Yes. This time, no problem, got there. My wife flew with me, so she sat next to me so that there's nobody's going like, his chub is on my lap, you know. <laughs> Nothing like that. The flight was totally fine. We get there, and we land, and I get my bag and shit, and she gets her bag from the roundabout. Right. And then I had my bag on the plane, and then I'm waiting for my big-ass hockey duffel bag to come out. And I packed every piece of clothing I have in it and shit, because I, I figure, like, I got to pack my fat stuff and my not-so-fat stuff, <laughs> because after a week, I'll fit into my fucking, my version of skinny jeans. But that being said, it's all just hockey jerseys, Pretty right? much, yeah, pretty yeah. much. A never-ending series. So anyway, my bag absolutely fucking goes missing. It's not on the roundabout. And I'm waiting, I'm waiting, it doesn't come out. And then I go into the booth, and I'm like, my bag didn't come out. So I think it's the only one, because nobody else is really sticking around. And so they looked into it, and, and my wife right away was just like, oh, my God, look at the luggage tags. You know, they give you luggage tags when you check your mm -hmm. shit in. One said Jennifer Schwabach. The other said Jennifer Schwabach. And the third said Lauren Davies. And I was just like, I'm not Lauren Davies. <laughs> I had her bag. They swapped our tags. So Lauren Davies' bag was tagged for Tucson, Arizona, and Kevin Smith's bag was tagged for Dulles, Washington, oh, D.C. Oh, Jesus. So I had no fucking clothes, dude. And it's tough. Like, I'm not like a normie like all you fuckers and shit. Like, <laughs> if you go somewhere and you lose your clothes, you're like, fuck, I'll just go to the mall and buy new clothes. Fat dude, it ain't the same way. Yeah. It's kind of like, remember the greatest American hero when he lost the suit, he was fucked? That's same right. thing here. <laughs> I got, like, one thing that fits me and shit, and suddenly it was fucking gone, and, and I was... And with hockey being on strike, there's no way you can get a new, new wardrobe. <laughs> you feel my pain, yeah, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, it was bad, man. So I went out, and I had to buy a whole new wardrobe, and I went to a fat guy store to buy the fucking wardrobe, which used to be a fucking blemish, but now the fat guy store, they sell character T-shirts. Like, it used to be back in the day, fat guy would go to a fat guy store, you buy a T-shirt, and it just says, Big Dog. Yeah, right. <laughs> Which everybody in the world, they're like, I know where you got that shirt. <laughs> it's a fucking scarlet letter, dude. It says, kiss the cook. Yeah, yeah, man. Right away, they're like, you bought that at the Fat Boy store. But now you go into the Fat Boy store, and they got a Ghostbusters t-shirt in 5X. Come nice. on, man. So suddenly, I could dress like a normal person in 10 size clothing. Yeah, so I go a normal into the person from the 80s. Yes, yes. Yeah. I go into the fucking store, man, and I start pulling everything off the racks, because now I have to rebuild my wardrobe stuff. And the two dudes behind the counter are going ape shit. And not because they're like, oh my God, it's Silent Bob. They're like, look how much this fat piece of shit is buying, man. <laughs> He's buying a whole new wardrobe, and I did. It's our I dream come true, a rich fat guy. <laughs> <laughs> I told him, I was like, you guys should close right now, man. It ain't gonna be better than this. But, uh, but I had a good time. Anyway, I lost my luggage. They found it, though. Fucking uh, 24 hours later, I was separated. So then I had to come home with double the amount of luggage I had. Right. I feel bad for you, but nothing personal. I feel a little worse for Lauren. Who, Lauren Davies? Lauren Davies, who went to her insurance conference wearing hockey jerseys. <laughs> and carrying a flashlight. That's right. Yeah. That's what you get for going in my bag. That's where I put my cum. <laughs> I 
me tell you another fucking... I, this is so weird, and this wasn't this trip, but last time I was on a plane, like yeah. a week before Christmas and shit, I went to uh, Toronto. I was coming back from Toronto. I swear, this is a fucking true story. I, no problems whatsoever. You know, I try to keep it low-key. I don't ever want to get thrown off again and shit. Right. So I, I, at one point, late in the fucking flight, late. Everyone else has got up, gone to the bathroom a few times and shit. I stay in the corner and shit, trying to be fucking, don't notice me. <laughs> Finally, I'm like, my bowels are about to break. I have to fuck it. I got to go take a leak. I guess that's not bowels. My kidneys are about <laughs> to break. I got to go take a leak. So I rush and I get into the fucking bathroom. And I, I, I was going to say, I whip it out. I find it. Right. And then I, <laughs> and I start going. You know, fucking as you do. Out of nowhere, dude. Right over my ear. Beep, 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 beep. The smoke alarm went off. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm fucking on fire here. You know? Like, what created this? And I'm curious. You're the ghost like, rider. I am. <laughs> I'm more of a piss protector. <laughs> so anyway, I'm in this fucking room, man, and I'm getting terrified because I'm like, my dick's out, the alarm's on. Someone might bust this door open and fucking stab me, you know? He's a threat and fucking take me out. Air marshal starts shooting through the door. <laughs> like, just don't, don't, step away, ladies. <laughs> bam, bam, bam. So I hear the fucking knock, and I'm, I am open the door, and I didn't even have it zipped up and shit. I was just pulling it up, and I open the door while I'm still doing it to show them, like, ain't no funny business going on. As soon as the door gets open this much, the lady pulls it open. She goes, what's going on in here? And I didn't know what else to say, but I was like, urine. And she goes, why the smoke alarm go off? I said, I don't know. I was just standing here pissing. I went off, I swear to you. And she's like, uh-huh, you weren't doing anything? That doesn't just go off like that. I was like, ma'am, I, I swear I was just as scared as you, man. It made me think of fucking like paranormal activity or something like that. <laughs> Have they ever done one on a plane? Because they should. And, <laughs> and so I was just trying to like, this wasn't me, and move back to my seat. And I went back to my seat, and the fucking stories were all convening like fucking, pick a little, talk a little, pick a little, talk a little, pick, 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 talk a little. They were looking at me and shit and having... Pointing Oh, and totally. Yeah. So finally, I'm trying to make friends with them. One last one's going, like, they all kind of go back to their stations, and they're like, we got our eye on you. And the one lady goes by, the one stewardess, and I, I go to stop her, because I'm like, I'm going to try to soften the situation, make sure she knows I still believe I didn't do anything in there. And right. So she's walking past, and I was just like, hey, what happened? And she's like, I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> and I was like, ma'am, I swear to you, I just went to the bathroom, and it just started going off. And she goes, mm-hmm, I know about you and planes. <laughs> Wow. And she walked away, and I was like, fuck, I've been profiled. Is it possible, given as much pot as you smoke, <laughs> that everywhere you go, you're just surrounded by a, just an invisible haze of smoke everywhere you go? <laughs> like Pigpen? Like Pigpen from Peanuts. <laughs> You're shuffling along, and there's just a cloud of pot smoke constantly <laughs> surrounding you, so that you t anytime you get near any smoke detector, you're going to set it off. It, it might be coming out of your pores. It could be, man. I, I hadn't really fucking thought of it. It must right. be. You must have the essence. I will say this, though. When I was at the fucking ranch, when I went to Canyon Ranch, yeah. like at one point, naturally, wherever I go in life, you know, people are like, you want to go here? And I'm like, if there's weed. Mm -hmm. So somebody set up a weed connection and whatnot, so I had weed and stuff. And for the first two days, I was like, right on. It's just like being home, except here, you know, we're away from home. But I'm smoking weed here, too, so it's cool. And then out of nowhere, dude, I don't know what struck me, but Tuesday night was the last time I smoked. Wednesday morning, I got up, and I was working, and I didn't, I forgot to smoke. And then all day went by, and I hadn't smoked weed. And my wife was like, something's fucking wrong here. Yeah. She's like, Talk about paranormal activity. <laughs> and I said, you know, now that I think about it, I didn't smoke weed all day. She's like, what are you doing? And I was just like, I don't know. I said, you know what? When I, 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 I'm, t I'm doing this little test with myself to see when I want to joint, instead I'm going to go exercise and see what fucking works out. And mm -hmm. she's like, right on for you. So I put it down. Like that first night, I was a little like fucking as if I didn't have coffee and shit. She was like, you know, you want to go to bed? I was like, what'd you fucking say? You know. <laughs> but by the next day, I was all smoothed out and shit. And I went for four days with no fucking weed. And that's the first time in four years now? Holy Don't shit. applaud it. It was stupid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> He's not happy about it, no. people. I just wanted to see if I could do it, and I did it and shit, and, and uh, you know, it was weird. Like, people, like, when Megan came to pick us up and, at the airport, she's like, you want me to bring a joint? And I was like, no, that's okay. And she goes, what? Yeah. Because <laughs> my life is organized around fucking weed. So I showed them all that. I was like, I could put it down. I didn't lose anything. I wasn't testy or anything like that. And as we were flying home, Jennifer's just like, are you going to keep doing it, not smoking? I was like, you know what, man? Yeah. Like, not that I'm against I'm saying I've never, never smoke weed again. I said, but like, I'm getting shit done and I'm feeling healthier and whatnot. I said, maybe I'll try not smoking for a week and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And we got home and I hugged my kid, went into my office and I was like, oh God. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sweet weed. Yeah, and, you know. That's what I figured. <laughs> 
So you're centered tonight. We have there's no problems. We're good to go. No, the weird thing is I was just working on this project all day long, so yeah. I hadn't gotten a smoke since this afternoon. I was running late, so I was like, do I stop home and get a joint? Because I've never done Hollywood Babylon not fucking stone. Right. So I'm not stone. I mean, there's some THC somewhere in my body, probably <laughs> under my balls a little bit, but yeah. but not enough to make me like, hey man, what's going on? So yeah. this is this is the first. I don't think you've ever done Hollywood Babylon with non-stone kids. I haven't. <laughs> And don't applaud. Frankly, I'm not looking forward to it. <laughs> I you always assume that's why you found me so funny, is that you were just stoned out of your ass. No, no. But you're not wearing a hockey jersey tonight? You're not stoned? Who the fuck are you? I know, man. I look like Junior from The Sopranos or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Big Pussy. I don't know. All right. Well, let's get to uh, yeah. the show. Uh, let's get to business right away. First order of business. Who bought me this shot, by the way? Who was, uh, that? was that you, sir? Thank you very much. You're very kind. Thank you. Thank you for getting him drunk. It'll make him more pliable later on when I'm like, show me your tits. Also, uh, tonight's show is sponsored by the good people at the Dave School in Florida. Dave stands for Digital Animation and Visual Effects School. They have a one-year training program in Orlando, Florida, down there at the back lot in Universal Studios, Florida. And it's an amazing program. It's a one-year training program, and they teach you uh, computer animation and visual effects. If you want to get in the entertainment industry, specifically film, this is a great way to get into it because they teach you on all the highest uh, tech uh, equipment, and they've got industry professionals who work with you. So if you want to get into this program, they are still taking applications. It's daveschool.com. You can check them out. But the most website. amazing thing is if, you can, if you're their work-study program, you can get a job answering phones at the school. And when uh, people go, yeah, I'm calling the Dave School, you could be like, Dave's not here, man. No. <laughs> can we get some pot? Does anybody have any pot? <laughs> uh, second order of business. Thanks to everyone. Uh, this, this, you guys are the best, uh, not only selling us out again tonight. Thank you so much. But thank you all for your kind tweets and emails about the Joe Schmo Show, which uh, debuted last week. Tell them what it is for the few unfamiliar with what's going uh, the on. The Joe Schmo Show is a show we do on Spike TV every Tuesday night. Check your local listings uh, for what time. It's 10 o'clock, I think, in most parts of the country. But the premise is it's, it's a reality show that is basically uh, scripted, except for one guy. He thinks he's on a real reality show. Everyone else on the reality show is all improv actors who are playing roles of reality show contestants on the show called A Full Bounty, The Full Bounty, where they think they're all competing to become a bounty hunter and win $100,000. And I play a legendary bounty hunter, Jake Montrose, who is not only, uh, second only probably to Dog the Bounty Hunter when it comes to uh, the uh, career of bounty hunting, but also the host of the show. And we had our first uh, two episodes last week and big, big numbers and everyone was watching. So please, if you aren't watching, tune in, but thanks to everyone who did, really appreciate it. I saw nothing but positive tweets in my Twitter feed of people saying, Ralph's amazing yeah, shit. And I kept it. writing back, I'm not in the show, leave me alone. Yeah. <laughs> you got your own business to I worry do. about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's start off the show as we do every week by giving shout outs to people who have come particularly long distances or are celebrating special occasions here tonight with us at the Lovitz. It's a shout out with Kevin and Ralph, so get your cock out. Get your cocks out. Because I'm not high, it's harder to do. I noticed. <laughs> we almost lost you. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, is uh, Dominic here celebrating his 18th birthday? Who is it? What's the name? Dominic. 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 Oh, so all the ladies screamed and Dominic was like, yes. Yeah. So you're celebrating his 18th birthday tonight. Is that allowed? Yeah, it's 18 or over here. Is it really? You just can't boot. Are you cheering for 18? It's just a number, lady. I like that kind of positivity, man. Check this out. I got a little dick. <laughs> That's the reaction I've always craved hearing. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, Dominic's here celebrating his 18th birthday, so. All right. Get it out of your system, ladies. Uh, <laughs> that, that should be it. I think Don't say 18th birthday again. Yeah, I know. Uh, get Dominic a shot. I know it's illegal, but what the fuck, you know? <laughs> Happy birthday, Dominic. Diplomatic immunity. 
Didn't even mention a country that time. Had nothing to do with anything. I'll do the other thing. Happy birthday. You're in Los Angeles. Put a dick in your mouth. There you go. Mazel tov. Today you are a man, Dominic. I hope you're getting some tail from one of those screaming broads, Dominic. Otherwise, it's just not worth it. <laughs> Fucking hell. I feel like... I feel like Carson Daly should be introducing videos or something. <laughs> Is One Direction here? Oh, shut up! Uh, how about the Jeffrey and Janin Wyman? Are you guys here? Right down front. You're not them! Stop cheering! <laughs> All the way from Richmond, Virginia. Well, thanks for coming a long way. Um, Jeffrey writes, my wife and I are visiting from Richmond, Virginia. <laughs> Diplomatic immunity, he writes. <laughs> we are members of the Richmond Rocky Haro Shadowcast. <laughs> now, for those who aren't familiar with shadow casting, it's when, it's when they show the movie, right, and you're at the theater and you guys act out the movie while it's showing behind you in costume. It's like what they did, if you ever saw Fame, they do the Rocky Horror Picture Show and everybody jumps on stage, does the time warp and shit like That's that. That's right. It's awesome. Yeah. And there's props and stuff, and they say, toast! And then everybody throws toast, toast in the air. And, and they open an umbrella, and they start shooting water guns into the it starts air. starts to rain, yeah. Or, or a hand lotion. That would, that's a good one, too. <laughs> oh, jeez. It's like Gooper. <laughs> um, now, Janet, you play Janet, right? And you're also the understudy for Frankenfurter? Is that what I understand? Well, Jeffrey writes, can you use your too seldom used Frankenfurter voice to, uh, what do you want me to do here? Oh, uh, yeah, please ask her to be less stingy with her leather Cheerio, Jeffrey writes. <laughs> Couldn't you have called it her time warp or something like that? I remember doing her time warp. How do you do I? So you've met my friend who wants to fuck your ass. Your husband's looking forward to your sphincter <laughs> with much antissa <laughs> patient. <laughs> Thanks for coming all the way from Virginia, guys. Welcome! God, I love Tim Curry in that. I Honestly, I love your Tim Curry better than Tim Curry's Tim Curry. I love Tim Curry in everything. I think he's, he just, he's good, just man. awesome. I loved him as legend. Remember, he's the big yeah, devil. He's like, I yeah, am a part of you all. Yeah. He gets sucked out and shit. Yeah. You ain't a part of nothing. <laughs> uh, how about uh, James, Randy, Mike, Janet, Leela, Steve, and Bon? <laughs> Robbie, Bobby, Ricky, and Mike. If I like the girl, who cares who you like? <laughs> They're up there on the third floor. Going to be at the show on the 12th with a bunch of my good friends. Randy's been listening to you guys for a long time. He's the one that got me into listening, not only to HBO, but podcasts in general. His wife, Isabel, will be delivering their first child in a few months. Oh, right on, man. New life. And I was hoping that Christian Bale and Bane could congratulate him. <laughs> well, sure, Batman and Bane, I guess, would be eager to congratulate someone on having a baby. But that almost writes itself. <laughs> it's not going to be easy. A lot of blood <laughs> and pain. You might have wait eight years until you have another one. <laughs> so you're going to have a baby. <laughs> well, I was wondering what would break first, your spirit or your hymen? <laughs> what a lovely, lovely singing voice. <laughs> Katie and Dustin here from... Hi, guys. How are you? Um, Listen to the subtle... <laughs> They're like, we ain't going to compete with that. Yeah. <laughs> Who could? <laughs> you uh, Keep it up, because you're killing it's his not, soul. It's not going to work. It's not going to work for me. <laughs> Swallow? <laughs> when in Rome... Uh, Katie writes, I surprised my husband by taking him to see Hollywood Babylon here for his birthday. We are driving down from Northern California. You surprised him with a cross-state drive? <laughs> get in the car, Dustin. We're going to get corn dogs. 
Katie, we've been on the road for 14 hours. Shut up, Dustin. <laughs> Three hours in, don't you think you're being taken for the ride yeah. at that point? Her, We're lo never her lover's waiting for you at a truck stop <laughs> with a 22 back in the head, bada bing. Uh, how did you surprise him? You come down here a lot. So, but he didn't know he was coming here. Oh, that's very nice of right you. Right on. That's adorable, man. Are you guys staying down here or you have to drive all the way back? Tomorrow. You drive tomorrow? Drive. So where are you going to stay tonight? You got a hotel? Right on. Because I was going to say, come to my place. You can totally fuck. <laughs> but we get to watch. Yeah, that's the only thing. <laughs> and he gets to do impressions. <laughs> well, K Katie adds that Dustin usually comes into the bedroom at night after listening to Ralph doing his impressions. <laughs> it's not even a demand. They're like, of course he's going to do impressions. <laughs> Who do you do? Who do you do, Dustin, of, of, of the ones that I do? You do my Pacino? Yeah. Let me hear a little Pacino. Oh, here I something. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty strong. Pretty strong. <laughs> I don't think you've ever said that as Pacino, man. I don't believe man. I have, but I'm going to add it now. It's it was a great good. choice. I'm going to say that every day of my wagon life. Ain't I something? <laughs> Could you please wish Dustin a happy birthday as Al Pacino? He would love that. Ooh. Well, I got to tell you, Dustin. I don't think I could do any better than that. Ooh, wow. Ain't I something? <laughs> oh, happy birthday, Dustin. Your wife's got another surprise for you at the hotel. It's a huge strap on. Come on now with the dildo. Ain't I something? I'm adding that. Ain't I something? I'm adding that. I like it. Uh, Patrick from Melbourne, Australia writes, uh, fan, longtime listener from Australia, I am not there tonight, but my girlfriend Lisa and her friends Lauren and Bianca are. Are you guys here? Hello. <laughs> like, we can't beat with a, compete with those fucking Americans. Lisa, Lauren, and Bianca from Melbourne, Australia. Uh, Lisa's a big fan of the Hollywood Babylon and would love a shout-out. So if Kevin could welcome Lisa to the land of the free and the home of the brave with his creepy voice. <laughs> I'm sure she'll blush every possible shade of red and be, uh, red and be very thankful, especially if Kevin gives, gives a particularly welcoming greeting to her vagina nicknamed Ethel. She covered her face, so man. So you know it's true. She's like, my pussy is Ethel. <laughs> What's my creepy voice? You know, your, your sexy voice that you think is sexy that everyone else thinks is creepy. <laughs> uh, that one. Uh, Who is it to? It's to uh, Lisa. And, of course, her About vagina Ethel. nicknamed Ethel. Yes. I, Lisa. Um, would you, you know what, man? Just call me Lucy because I want to hang out with Ethel. <laughs> That's not creepy. That's seductive. Whatever you say, Captain. Lucy and Ethel, really? That's why, isn't that her name? Yeah, yeah. I don't know any Ethels. Just what saying, was your, what all, was your joke of, about? All of our listeners from the 50s are enjoying that right now. <laughs> yeah, it was fine. It was fine. Thanks. Uh, my name is Matt is the next shout out. I'll be there with my girlfriend Carly. Are Matt and Carly here tonight? Greetings, They're giving guys. you a run for your money, ladies. Coming to the show is an early birthday present for my girlfriend. I will be turning 21 on Thursday the 17th. Ouch! So close to being able to drink, but not close enough. He's going to drive you home? Oh, so you're getting shit-faced. <laughs> yeah. And you're getting anal. Yeah. <laughs> we got some takers. Yeah. Dominic saying, what the fuck did I come here for? <laughs> this um, is the worst birthday of my life. Matt was writing, I hope, I, I hope that you can have David Bowie sing happy birthday to me. <laughs> and tell Carly, I'm sorry for the drunken ass I will inevitably make of myself on Thursday. 
when she takes me out for a day of surprises she has set up for me. You know she has surprises set up for you? They're not fucking surprises then, are they, Matt? All right, uh, David Bowie's singing Matt a happy birthday in advance of his 21st birthday. At least I could do for you. Happy birthday to you, Matthew. Happy birthday to you, Matthew. You're not old enough to drink yet, but on Thursday you will be shit-faced. Happy birthday to you, Matthew. Your 21st birthday's coming. On Thursday you'll be hammered, and Carly's got some surprises for you. Happy birthday to you, Matthew. You're going to be so drunk on the happy birthday. <laughs> you passed out after you came already? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Vibrator's too late. Well, happy birthday in advance to you, Matt. Happy you birthday, have a good time. man. He's like, I was going to get anal till that. Yeah. <laughs> that was one of the surprises. <laughs> We also get emails from all around the world from our listeners, James. Ain't no drag. Garmin's got an email back. <laughs> Featuring Kevin's reactions. This email is kind of a serious one to get us kicked off. Uh, it comes from Jeff Reedy in Winnipeg, Canada. I'm writing in regards to my good friend Dave Stock from Winnipeg. Dave's an avid HBO listener. is one of the reasons I started listening to the show. Last year, Dave won a brave fight with cancer, which struck right around the time his baby girl was born. Dave's now in another fight because he has just been diagnosed with leukemia. Oh, fucking. What you used to call that? Double down. What is it? Double down on the fuck you card? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It double down the fuck you card right yeah, there for you. That's tough. Uh, he'll be spending the next four to six weeks in the hospital undergoing treatment to try to beat this again. I was wondering if you'd give him a shout out to encourage him to keep his spirits up and tell him that his friends and family love him a great deal and we're all behind him. I know this would mean the world to him very much. Uh, thanks very much, his good friend Jeff Reedy. Right Can I go so first? Absolutely. Oh, Dave. Stop it. <laughs> he doesn't need the creepy voice. No? Okay. It's not helping. Dave, you could both through this, man. If you fucking beat cancer, leukemia is a bitch by comparison. Yeah. You could totally take it down. Yeah. Uh, leukemia blows. And uh, if it was if it if it was a, a person, I would I would fuck it in the ass. Pretty vulgar. <laughs> and not respectful to leukemia at all. No, well, I don't I don't respect leukemia. I'm not a fan. Fair enough. I, I am you know I'll, I don't care if it's popular or not. I'll take a stand right now. I am anti leukemia. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> I don't know if I could do the show with you anymore. You're too Sorry. out there for me. Man. I know I'm pushing the envelope politically, but I will say right here, right now, I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm against leukemia. I'll tell you that much right now. So, of course, Dave, thanks so much for listening, and we really are uh, pulling for you for, for what it means, but your friends and family, more importantly, are right behind you, so God bless, and uh, hang Do in it, there, Dave. Buddy. Hang in there. Uh, Joey Martinez sends in a little fan art. You know, I love the fan art. He says, uh, keep your, thanks for all the free funny, get, keep your bat on and your babble on, and he wrote us, a, uh, he drew us rather, a photo of you and me at a bar, apparently, dressed as superheroes. This is his uh, little piece of artwork. Oh, that's good, man. I like that. How come you get to be Batman? I got to be Robin. We've had this argument. I know. Yeah, we've had yeah, it yeah. before. It's in my head, I was always Batman, but you are Batman. I am more Robin. Uh, not in that photo. No, and, no. You know, and the R on my chest, Ralph and all, it's the R, you know, it makes that's, sense. That's kind of fucking yeah. help, yeah. And apparently I'm drinking pornographic whiskey because it's a... It's a <laughs> Triple X whiskey over there, so <laughs> couldn't get the rights from Jack Daniels, could you, for your fan art, Jose? <laughs> or Joey, rather? Ouch. His name's Martinez. I automatically called him Jose. That's, <laughs> that's Joey Martinez. I apologize, Joey. That's the last fucking picture I'll ever draw you. <laughs> you can take the racist out of Philadelphia, but you can't take. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm not racist at all. I hate everyone. <laughs> uh, our next email is from France. My name is. You tell Garrick. me. Garrick. I try. All right. <laughs> my girlfriend Charlotte and I are planning to make a trip to the U.S. this summer. I'm trying to get my girlfriend to agree to a double pilgrimage to Kevin Smith land by visiting the secret stash in New Jersey and coming to see Hollywood Babylon in California. Oh, shit. Both sides of the country. Yeah. You might be able to convince her to come with me in your John Lennon voice. She is the huge Beatles fan. I'm sure she won't be able to resist. She may not even know he's dead. <laughs> he's got one of them smart ones. Yeah. 
She must be a huge Beatles fan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She thinks Lennon is just lying low. <laughs> He's just retired. I'll let you know how it worked. Pafoui uh, putain de sous, he writes in French, which he says is a literal translation of babble the fuck on. But really? it doesn't mean anything in French, he says. <laughs> so there you go. All right, a little John Lennon for your girlfriend Charlotte uh, Garrick to try to get you guys from France to California this summer. Hello, Charlotte. Yeah, I think you should come to California to see Ralph and Kevin. They're very funny. And most of the people in America are very nice. Except for that one guy I ran into outside my apartment building. <laughs> oh, shut up! <laughs> it's 30 years! Two, Get over it! Two tsunamis, Get over sir! It. <laughs> oh my god, I can't imagine. I just hope... It's always been my double fantasy that you would be on this stage saying that, sir. Number nine, number nine. I just hope you're not a big fan of Catcher in the Rye. Anyone remember anything about Mark David Chapman? I remember it. Yeah. Anyway, good luck, uh, Garrett, getting her out of here now. Uh, Wes Moore of London, England writes in, uh, Hey, guys, I was looking around eBay earlier this week to see if I could find any cool Kevin Smith stuff that I didn't already have. There was nothing on the UK eBay site, so I decided to check out the international auctions. That's when I came across this listing for Clerks Uncensored DVD 2001. I guess that's the uh, Clerks cartoon series, Clerks right? cartoon, yeah. yeah. He said, uh, I was surprised at the listing. I suppose it is a creative way to sell something. Cheers, guys. Keep up the good work. Westmore, London, England. He sent in a uh, still store of uh, how they were selling your DVD from this particular seller. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> Doesn't mention it in the description or anything. It's just the DVD nestled between a giant pair of tits. Yeah. I've seen them all, and that would make me buy it again. If you had sold the original series that way, you'd still, <laughs> still be still on be the on air. air. <laughs> but no. And uh, this last email comes from Matthew Fields in Covington, Louisiana. He writes, after hearing Pee Wee Herman do it, can we please make the Green Lantern Oath a new segment? I, like I support that idea. For anyone who didn't hear it before... Ralph did uh, the Green Lantern's oath as Pee Wee Herman. It right. was kind of funny. Um, apparently, Matthew Fields in coming to Louisiana would like to make it a, a regular segment. Well, I figured it's a new year. Let's give it a, let's throw it up there and see if it sticks, you know? Right. And he says, I would like it as the McDonald's Fry Girl. Ah. So we'll see if this is worthy of weekly uh, visiting or not. But we, it's a new segment, and we do have a new jingle for it. Our buddy Dan Lewis Elf threw together a new jingle for the segment. I asked him if he had any ideas. So uh, this is a brand new segment we're debuting tonight for you people. You'll see it for the first time. It's called Ralph's Green Lantern Oath. In brightest day, in blackest night, Ralph's impressions shine most bright. The oath will make the crowd go mental. If it's not fucked up by Ryan Reynolds, Ralph's Green Lantern Oath. He is a fucking genius. I love him so <laughs> he much. He really is. Little bits of, the 13 seconds of brilliance. Makes every me time so he happy, I know. Yeah. Uh, all right, Matthew. This is McDonald's Fry Girl recharging her power ring as the Green Lantern. <laughs> so you're going to go to hell based on the first look alone. Before you utter a syllable, it's just, it's so hard. It's defeating her. In Bray's day. <laughs> In Black is night. <laughs> no evil shall escape my sight. <laughs> Let those who worship evil might. Beware my power, <laughs> McNugget's light. <laughs> we may have a keeper, we'll see what happens. 
2013, you're still no nicer than you were in 2012. <laughs> Fuck no. <laughs> Every week we say goodbye to some people from show business who had lengthy and uh, notable careers, and it's important for us to give them tribute as they pass on to wherever we go when it's all over. It's called Tinseltown Stiffs. Now, another edition of Tinseltown Stiffs. They will be missed. They will be missed indeed. Uh, passing away this week at the age of 85, is a legendary pop music icon named Patti Page. Now, you may not know the name, but she was, and I found this surprising when I did some research, the biggest selling female artist of the decade of the 50s. Sold more records than any other woman in the 1950s. Wow. I could not believe that because her music is deeply shitty. <laughs> she had four number one hits throughout the 50s. Okay. Her signature song, The Tennessee Waltz, became one of the best-selling songs of the 20th century, selling nearly 15 million copies, Holy crap. which is huge. This is the song she's best known for. It's called The Tennessee Waltz. I was dancing with my darling to the Tennessee Waltz. What the fuck was passing for music in the 50s? <laughs> you know what her second biggest hit was? What? You're right, madam. How did you know that? Loud screaming girl. Just gave her another reason to scream. She sang that. How much is that doggy in the window? <laughs> They're like, that's my fuck song. I turn that on when I'm taking it doggy style. <laughs> Shut up. Do not groan at that. It was fucking genius, that joke. <laughs> This song had a guy, probably the drummer or somebody, literally barking. Oh, really? Yeah, here's a little taste of that, that hit. How much is that dog in the window? The one with the wackily chain. That was a fucking hit. Anyway, she, uh, she died. Big bucket of win. I'll tell you something. She was a big deal in the 50s. She had a major TV special on each of the three networks year after year after year. That's the first time ever anyone had done And has special. anybody ever done that again? I don't think again? they have, maybe. No, no. Maybe the president when he's giving an address or something. She was in a bunch of movies, too. She was a big deal. Uh, passed away this week at the Huge age of Huge bucket of win. Big bucket of win. This next person, I this would like you personal. to take this one, if you would. I will. this and guy I, was a super talent, and it was really... It he was. was really ladies, exciting. stop your shrill laughing for a second. A friend of mine... Shut up, bitch. A friend, a friend of mine died. Hold it. Put your shirt down. A friend of mine. If that's the reaction you get when you say a friend of mine died, I'm she gonna wants tell to everybody. You. Yeah, a friend of mine died. Show me your tits. Um, a friend of mine died, and he was a really good guy, a really dear director. Some people uh, know uh, some of his work. Maybe you don't know the extent of all his work. Gentleman's name was David Ellis. David Ellis was, uh, uh, to put it quickly. David Ellis was the director of Snakes on a Plane. Now, that's just one thing that he did. David Ellis led this amazingly fucking long life. He was from Malibu. The dude became a champion surfer. Like, he's still, con well, not anymore because he passed, but he still was considered up until fucking a few days ago one of the best surfers on the planet, yeah. like one of the top 50 or whatever. David kind of stumbled into stunt work on movies. I believe one of the first ones he did was he doubled Kurt Russell or something in like the world's strongest man or the right. world's fastest one of the man. Films. One of the Disney yeah. flicks. So he started as a stunt man and worked in stunts for years and years. And what happens is if you're around movies long enough and you do stunts and stuff, eventually they ask you to do second unit. Second unit is when you have a movie that you're making that's real big and shit. You need stunts to be done, but you want to concentrate on the key performances of the actors. You have a second unit. Some movies have third and fourth units, depending how big they are and stuff. So, like, at one point when I was thinking about doing that Green Hornet movie, I was just like, I can't direct action. I don't know how to make cars and move and shit like that. And they were like, do you think Brian Singer directed all of X-Men 2? And I was like, of course. They're like, no, he directs the performances. And a lot of the big action sequences, second unit comes in and shit. And I was like, oh, you're kidding me. So on Cop Out, man, I needed a second unit director because there was some driving stuff, some action stuff. And they said, we're going to give you David Ellis. David has been a second unit director and a first unit director. He became a director not just of stunts and shit like that. He became so good at it, they were like, give him a whole movie. So he started making flicks and directing flicks. So the guy went from like a surfer 
to being uh, a stunt man to being a second unit director, which is like I'm no longer doing the stunts, but I'm figuring them out and shooting the stunts. And the director of the movie is like, trust you enough to be like, you take these five pages and go shoot the shit out of it and stuff. And those cats don't get credit in the upfront. They're usually buried in the back. They'll mm -hmm. say second unit director and stuff. He came in and worked for us, and he was it, like, he's a wizard at putting together moving shots. And he was so sweet, one of the nicest people in the world I ever met. Uh, his, he asked Megan, my sister, he was like, I want to give Kevin a thank you gift for giving me a job, which I'm like, I didn't really give you a job, dude. Like, you're a working director and shit, but he's always happy to be working and he like try new things. So he's like, I want to get him a gift. What should I get him? And Megan's like, I don't know, he smokes weed. He goes, perfect. And then, <laughs> and we never thought anything of it. And two days later, he sent me like a, a box that had syrup in it and shit. And I was like, that's nice. He sent me syrup. And Megan's like, look under the bottom. And I looked, and I was like, he sent me weed. <laughs> Now, that's a cute story, but this is my favorite David Ellis story. This is what he told me, and, and he was a beautiful light in this world, and it's sad that he passed, and particularly he was young, 60 61. Years old. Yeah. Um, he told me a story. He was a stuntman. This is cute as fuck. He's a stuntman, and he was in Louisiana, New Orleans. They were shooting this stuff. So he's in a car, and he's trying to talk to someone in his cell phone. So he's like, fuck, he pulled over into what was a cul-de-sac. So he pulls over, and he's on the phone going, uh-huh, yeah, we're going to shoot this thing, but like, I need this much more, blah, blah, blah. Car rolls up to him, like behind him, and then a car rolls up to the side of him, and he's about to get carjacked. He could totally recognize it. The dudes are stepping out of the car with guns like this. So David, I guess the car pulled in front of him, because this is what happens. Uh, he did what's known as a, in the stunt business as a J-turn. Out of nowhere, he's a trained stunt driver, so these dudes are blocking him in, he pulls, they pull out guns and start walking toward him, and David goes, fuck it. And the car does this fucking backwards speeding J. It does a skid around and faces them like Batman. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what happened? He's going, they sped away. <laughs> I love that, man. So he was a really sweet guy. And a lot of people like kick second unit directors and shit because they're like, oh, you're not a big fucking director. But he did direct a movie that we all know and most of us kind of love, which is Snakes on a Plane, yeah. as well as Final Destination 2. And he also did The Final Destination. Um, very talented man, very beloved in this town and business. And I, and I met him, and, and again, not just like, he was a good guy in the movie business, one of the most fascinating people I ever met. I was heartbroken to hear that he died. Where was it? South Africa. He was prepping a show. He was going to direct another film. He was going to be with Sam Jackson again. He yeah. was directing another Sam Jackson movie. Uh, he did the action sequences, as you mentioned, for Waterworld, Matrix Reloaded, and Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. So this guy was the real He's deal. He's the you know? second yeah. director on Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's yeah, Stone. Yeah, come on. He was a huge cauldron of when he will be missed. David, I love you. Thank you for your help, man. Thank you for your friendship. And lastly, for those of you who are listening uh, from out of state of California, maybe you're here from out of state, you may not recognize the name, but uh, locals here in California will recognize the name of Huel Hauser, who passed away this week. Huel Hauser was... Uh, the host of maybe the worst show on television. <laughs> oh, you're fucking... It's what a fucking bitch you are, It's man. fucking true. Uh, look, no disrespect to the man. He was beloved, but his show was a turd. <laughs> it was called California's Gold, and Huel, every week for the PBS, local PBS station here in California, would go out with a handheld mic and a cameraman and would spend an hour talking to somebody who, like, s sold bras. I shit you not. That was an entire episode. But give him props because he was the originator almost of the sentiment, interested is interesting. Right. Because the people he were talking to, it could be something like, I make paper bags. And fucking Huel was just like, isn't that amazing? That's amazing. <laughs> you sit here all day and you manufacture paper bags. Wow. And each of these bags, they will hold something, won't they? Some of them will go to supermarkets. Other ones will go to clothing stores. You don't know where these bags will end up. Some of them will be put on children's heads and they'll cut out eye holes. You can draw on them. It's amazing. This fucker would go on for an hour. And PBS, and our show is fucking 60 minutes, by the way. Um, I kid, but uh, Yule had a way of drawing you in. He would, he would talk to the world's whistling champ. And um, wow, you whistle all kinds of music. Not just songs we think of as whistle songs, like the Andy Griffith theme. No, 
you whistle somewhere over the rainbow. That is amazing. I would have loved to be interviewed by him because he would have made you feel like the fucking smartest, <laughs> best person in the, in the world. world. Yeah. You invented the rainbird sprinkler head? Anyway, this show was on the air for 20 years. Only on PBS could a show like this last for 20 years. He had California's Gold, he had Video Log, he had uh, Visiting with Yule Hauser. He was never out of work. And he became sort of a local icon just for the sheer fact that everyone knew Huel Hauser. He passed away this week after just retiring 67 years old, his home in Palm Springs, California. For those of you who aren't familiar with Huel's work, I did bring in a little taste, a little video of his work. This is Huel Hauser in his prime, prime Huel Hauser moment where he is on a small avocado farm here in the state of California. <laughs> Some of you may be familiar with this piece of work. And he's talking to the avocado farmers. And as you can imagine, he runs out of things to talk about about 18 minutes into the hour-long segment. Wow, look at those trees. They're covered with avocados. And he realizes that one of the farmer's dogs is eating the avocados on the ground. Huel lost his shit. Because he had never seen a dog eat an avocado before. I present for your viewing pleasure Huel Hauser and the avocado-eating dog. Your dog is eating an avocado. <laughs> yeah, that, that dog eats avocados. All our dogs eat avocados. If you're an avocado farmer, your dog likes them too. I've never seen a dog eat avocados before. Uh, that shell is. That shell's. You don't get much cleaner than that. You don't get Look. that clean in your kitchen. <laughs> Look at this. That dog ate every speck of that avocado. Yeah. I'm going. <laughs> now, do you have a healthy dog? I got a very healthy dog. You want to see how to make a dog happy? Now that's an avocado eating dog. Yeah, sure is, Huel. <laughs> that sure as shit is a avocado eating dog. Be fair, dude. He's more interesting, fascinating, and fucking compelling than the Kardashians. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> well, sh yeah. It's like saying I'm a better track and field runner than Stephen Hawking. <laughs> Hardly a comparison, sir. Big bucket of win for Big Huel. Bucket of win. Huel bucket of win, if you That will. is amazing. Yes. I am dead. <laughs> I won't be living anymore. Wow. <laughs> My body sure is still. And yet, I'm still interested in things. <laughs> At this point in heaven, God's like, send him to hell. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Look at those pearly gates. <laughs> Are all those people coming through to go to heaven? Wow. Look at all these clouds. Those angels have halos. <laughs> that cherub's eating an avocado. <laughs> that sure is an avocado-eating cherub. <laughs> Each week we celebrate celebrities who are able to get out of the way of their own egos and do something for someone else. They're known as the Hollywood helpers. Ooh, ooh, ah. Well, margaritas. Ooh, ooh, ah. Hollywood helper. Uh, uh, uh. Hollywood helper. Uh, uh, uh. Ooh, ooh, ah. uh, uh, uh. Hollywood helper. Come on now. Hollywood, Hollywood helper. It's sexy. Wow. You sure do touch yourself a lot. I'll be doing you a all fucking night. <laughs> Uh, the quick, uh, quickly, in Hollywood Helper update. Uh, I guess it was two weeks ago. I guess it was the, uh, oh, no. the New Year's Eve show. Well, this is a good story, but a sad story. We talked about the fact that J.J. Abrams, director of the, uh, the rebooted Star Trek franchise, had his second one in the pipeline called Star Trek Into Darkness. And there was a huge Star Trek fan who was also a film buff, was uh, stricken with cancer. And his wife and his best friend went on the internet and said, before he dies, his one thing is he wants to see some of the new Star Trek film. J.J. Abrams caught wind of that, showed him a rough cut of the film uh, just after Champion the new year. Champion move, really sweet human move. Especially for a guy like J.J. who likes to keep his shit under wraps and doesn't want anyone to see stuff. Yeah. Uh, quick update, the, uh, the guy who, who was able to see that rough cut did pass away just a couple days ago uh, oh, after he saw that, that film. His wife and his best friend wrote to The Hollywood Reporter that it was pretty much the last thing he did. He got into bed, and then uh, days later, he passed away. But he, he was thrilled to get the chance to meet J.J. Abrams and to see the film. That's so fucking that's, that's awesome. 
kind of cool to do that for somebody, you know? There's a place in heaven for JJ, man. That's really sweet. Yeah. Uh, this week's Hollywood Helpers, believe it or not, uh, Charlie Sheen you, made wait, the list real again. quick. Could yeah. you imagine loving something so much that it makes you okay to die? Like, think about it. The dude saw Star Trek. He was like, okay. I'm good. Like, that's that makes me want to cry. That's fucking powerful, man. Yeah. And people, like, talk down movies or geek culture or something. But it's like, for some people, it means everything. And yeah. for this guy, he was like, before I leave this world, I want to know what Star Trek Into Darkness is all about. And I fucking heard that it's about anal. <laughs> no. <laughs> into, right. into Darkness does not reference no. going into that particular dark place. No. I got a little too literal, I guess. You may be. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Charlie Sheen made this week's Hollywood Helper list, believe it or not. He, he's, a, he's a big uh, dick, but, <laughs> but he seems to keep doing nice things one after the other. He gave uh, Lindsay Lohan uh, $100,000 to pay off her tax bill a couple weeks ago. Right. Uh, he also set up a fund for a young lady who had a unique kind of cancer, a rare kind of cancer. I heard that one, and I heard then he also threw open his shutters and said, boy, what day is this? <laughs> no, that's Ebenezer Scrooge. he said, Scrooge, Christmas, he said, go of. buy a goose. <laughs> this week, he paid for the funeral of the photographer, the paparazzo that got killed while trying to shoot Justin Bieber in that Ferrari. I mean, that, he may be Charlie Sheen, but that's a classy move. Very man. classy That's very move. classy. Uh, the thing ran about $12,000. He wrote a check to the parents of Chris Guerra, this photographer who was killed trying to get a shot of Justin Bieber's Ferrari on the freeway, stepped into traffic and got himself killed. He said, look, uh, this tragic incident erases the line between photographer and subject, and his condolences went to the parents. He said, as parents, we are all not supposed to bury our children. And so out of a move of... Uh, Holy uh, shit. Out of the mouth of babes, another Yeah, vermin. really. So truth. it was very nice of him to step up and take care of the, very. the cost of the funeral for the, that family. You didn't really have enough money to pay for it. So. Dare we say he is winning. <laughs> no, we daren't. And another unsuspected member of the celebrity community is on the Hollywood Helper list this week, Justin Bieber, believe it or not. Now, well, hold look, on, hold wait on. for it, wait for it. I, just, we have to be fair. I, I'm with you. I think he's the spawn of Satan. But you can't deny that this week in Utah, he found out that a seven-year-old girl named Millie Flam was stricken with leukemia and had tickets to his show in Salt Lake City but could not attend because she was too busy in the hospital getting treatment. Oh, fuck. Uh, his, her family went on the uh, social media and let everyone know that Justin Bieber was her favorite and she was really sorry to miss the concert. He found out via Twitter, I guess, that she was going to be in the hospital, so he went out of his way to visit her at the Children's Medical Center where she was, seven-year-old Millie. He went by to visit That's her. That's a classy move, man. Really classy. Family says he hung out for a while, sang to her her favorite song, Baby, Baby, Baby. Oh. Uh, gave her a guitar pick because you know he's known for shredding <laughs> even when he does something nice he's a dick <laughs> Ralph's pants are stained <laughs> he's right but I can't believe he can see that from here uh, and then he kissed her goodbye with tongue, which I thought was inappropriate. <laughs> oh, stop it. At seven. Here's a photo of Justin and uh, little Millie at the cancer center. Right on. And I, look, I, he's a huge dick, but that's, that's kind of a cool thing. Uh, he then, <laughs> he looks like vanilla ice. He does, sir. You're, you're right. Uh, before he left, he asked little Millie, do you have any medical marijuana? He said before she <laughs> She was, like, and then she he was seven, a blunt with didn't really know. So <laughs> that's uh, this week's Hollywood Helpers. Every week we take a look at moments in TV and film uh, that are multi-million dollar productions that somehow stuff gets captured on the screen that really shouldn't be there. They should know better. They should catch this. The, the hundreds of pairs of eyes that see a film or TV show before it reaches the public. It's shit that should not be. And now for shit we should not see. Here's some shit that should not be. This week's shit that should not be was sent from Chad in Boston, Massachusetts. This is from the uh, the big Disney TV franchise, High School Musical. Oh my God, I love it. Musical? I cry every time I watch it. <laughs> All their dreams come true, Ralph. You know how often that happens in real life? Never. Those kids are magic. <laughs> not what I was expecting at all. <laughs> Uh, High School Musical, of course, the story of a, uh, of a downtrodden uh, group of uh, inner-city black basketball players. Uh, 
who uh, have to use the sport to try to rise out of poverty. Oh, no, it's a bunch of attractive white kids who are playing basketball. Uh, Zach Efron is the leader of the pack. Very hard to play basketball with a dildo in your ass, by the way. So give, give him some credit. No, you know, really? Oh, yeah. No. Oh, yeah. You know how you know this team is a bunch of rich kids in this high school musical movie? Yeah. Because the next clip we're at the show, which uh, stunned Chad from Boston, Massachusetts so much he had to send it in. Uh, either this is a massive piece of shit that should not be in this film, or they're shooting the team video while they're playing basketball with a steady cam. <laughs> you can see on the court, while Zach's team is running up the court, the steady cam operator is right there about center court following them all up. Here's a little piece of tape demonstrating the shit that should not be from High School Musical. Yeah, that guy right there. Steady cam? Let's, let's zoom in, shall we? This is the guy's ass. There he is right there. Yeah. That's him shooting the team. Go Mustangs. <laughs> Now, what was, the, what was the team from... Uh, Wildcats. 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 Gotcha. You're all fucking busted. <laughs> you watch that piece of shit. <laughs> also, every week, we look at some exquisite acting from an A-list actor or actress who turns in a less-than-A-list performance. This week is... is we cheated. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of fun, but uh, the segment is called Exquisite Acting. To be or not to be, that is the question. Welcome to the world of exquisite acting with Ralph Garman and Kevin Smith. Um, this week, again, it's kind of a cheat because we could literally feature Nicolas Cage and or Keanu Reeves every week. <laughs> this week comes from listener Sven Mombasa who says Keanu Reeves' performance in The Lake House has a moment in it which is quite magical and after reviewing it I have to agree. Uh, the Lake House, for those of you who aren't familiar, is a romantic drama about a magic fucking mailbox. <laughs> that's right, that's what it was. I don't, not fucking around. There's a lake house that's got a mailbox. And if you put a letter in it, it goes through time. And there was a little dog who was like, pow, 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 pow. <laughs> the, the, you don't like this movie, shut up. <laughs> I thought you meant you like Blue's Clues. I was like, me too. <laughs> we just figured out Blue's Clues because we're really smart. Uh, Keanu Reeves and Sandy Bullock, which uh, obviously producer said, Speed was a hit. Let's put them into a magical mailbox movie. Uh, they, they play the owners of a lake house at different times, and they keep sending, stop loving this movie. <laughs> They send each other love letters through the magic mailbox that takes them two years in the future or past, depending on where you're standing. Yep. And in the film, uh, Keanu Reeves is told from the future and or the past, I don't know and I'll never know because I'm never watching this fucking movie. <laughs> He's told that he is going to have a cold. He's going to catch cold. <sighs> and there's a moment in the movie where Keanu Reeves catches a cold and sneezes. And that sneeze has important reference to him. It has important meaning to him. And so his, his reaction to his sneeze is the stuff of exquisite acting. It really is. Now, again, I, as I mentioned, we cheated a little bit because the clip I got from YouTube doctors this up with some sound effects a little bit. But it doesn't change the performance at all. So please enjoy the exquisite acting of Keanu Reeves from the Lake House while he sneezes. That's an important sneeze right there. That's a significant sneeze. That had all the feel of the dramatic chipmunk. <laughs> exactly. Whoa. I just sneezed. That is significant. Ah. Every week we take a look at my buddy Kevin Smith and if somehow, some way, people get photographs of him in places that he really doesn't belong. It's a weekly segment known as Kev In. What's Kev In today? Something crazy or awesome or gay? And by gay we mean homosexual, like maybe some dudes, but what's Kev In? What's Kev In this week? The theme this week 
is uh, my partnership with my friend Kevin Smith. Uh, people often ask us when they listen to Babylon, uh, first of all, they ask, who the fuck's Ralph Garman? And then <laughs> the second thing they ask is, have you guys worked together before? You guys seem like you have such good chemistry together. Have you, you have a history of working together? And, and the answer is yes, we have worked together before. A lot of people think Hollywood Babylon was the first project we worked on, but we've been working together for years, and uh, these people have sent in photos of capturing some of the work that Kevin and I have done. Uh, first of all, you may remember Kevin and I from Magic Mike. Do you remember where we played strippers in Magic Mike? Yeah. <laughs> Kevin was a little bulkier than I was. <laughs> he worked a little harder in the gym than I did. That's my Jake Montrose beard right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. That's also a commercial, a plug for Schmo. <laughs> That's right, yes. Uh, now, years before we did Magic Mike together, you may remember us as uh, Bob and Doug McKenzie from the Great White North. Do you remember? Remember the word? <laughs> <laughs> Take off, you hoser. Take off, eh? Where's the back bacon, eh? <laughs> We're out of beers, eh? Were you an SCTV guy? Really? Huge, huge. Oh, man, I love that. We could, we I could, love we could remake especially. that thing right now, looking at that thing. I love the movie. I love the album. I love. They did a cartoon series not too long ago, Breathe yeah. Shorts. It was pretty yeah. good. And, of course, uh, the one most people know us from when they think of the partnership between Kevin and myself, it's our Oscar-nominated turn <laughs> in the film Rain Man. You may remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin comes to get me out of the asylum. Look how big my head is, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely have a big head. Yeah. Uh oh, uh oh, Jersey girl. Uh oh. Yeah. Uh oh. Uh oh. Relationship between Affleck and Lopez. That's a problem. Uh oh. <laughs> you know, it's been a few years, but that really hurts. <laughs> Let's take a look at this week's HBO headline, shall we? <laughs> give me head, give me head, give me headlines, and give me head. <laughs> Every week we take a look at the news of show business. This week, boy, Lindsay Lohan, she, uh... Say she, it right. Lindsay Lohan! Lindsay won the Chelsea Award at our New Year's Eve show, and she is not one to rest on her laurels. She has got her foot to the pedal when it comes to just being a, the biggest talentless cunt you've ever met. Um, so much so that every week, of course, we do give her her own moment. Lindsay Lohan, why don't you come to your senses? This week, Lindsay was uh, featured on the TV show on the Bravo TV network called Million Dollar Decorators where it's, it's like the show uh, Extreme Makeover, where they go and they take uh, disadvantaged people, socially disadvantaged people, and they, they give them a new home and stuff. Only this time, they give a lot of shit to rich people, <laughs> which I think is less satisfying as a show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they go into million-dollar homes, and they redecorate for celebrities and stuff, and it's supposed to be uh, interesting. Uh, they did this show on Bravo, and the big reveal came, and it's time to show Lindsay Lohan her million-dollar, uh, multi-million-dollar Beverly Hills mansion with the new furnishings and everything else. And Lindsay did not show up for the reveal show. So Bravo filmed it anyway and aired it without the star looking at the home. So we're like, we guess she would have said thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Lindsay would have been very impressed with this couch. So now Bravo and the decorators involved in the project are talking about suing her and repossessing the half a million dollars worth of furniture that they put in her home. Did you read the New York Times piece? I'm glad you brought that up, sir, because Lindsay Lohan was featured in the New York Times this week. A, uh, a reporter did a story called, Here is what happens when you cast Lindsay Lohan in your movie. Which, to be fair, is a very New York Times ty type of title and doesn't scream, read this article, but I read this article, all 12 pages of it, and it was the best thing I've read in 2013. Granted, it's early, but <laughs> yes. it's... It was amazing. It was such a page turner, and it literally really was because there were multiple pages. And it's a, an incredibly gripping read. It's about the story of casting uh, Paul Schrader casting Lindsay Lohan in this very small independent movie he kickstarted called The Canyons. Right. She's starring opposite real life porn star James Dean. James Dean. Um, and D E E N. Yeah, yeah. Not the dead one. <laughs> the one that fucks a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, but she, the article is, is such a page turn because it's all about like in order to make movies, she was having trouble getting insured 
on flicks, you know, because when you're making Herbie and shit and you're not showing up, like she didn't show up for the $250,000 house thing, you know, they got to lose a whole day of shooting. You report it to the insurance company, hope to get some rebate back. Right. No insurance company would cover. On this movie, The Canyons, it doesn't matter because she was paid the princely sum of how much per day? $100 a day. <laughs> she could make more money blowing guys behind a dumpster at the 7-Eleven on Pico <laughs> Avenue here than she could making this movie. That's, that's the dire straits her career is in, that she had to accept this deal. That's, that's that, to be fair, that is how the, the, I think the Times Online in the UK or UK Mail or whatever, Daily Mail, I looked, read an article, and they were like, she's hit rock bottom. But this is an independent flick. And, and she to was work promised with Paul Schrader, profit participation at the back end. If it made absolutely. any profit, she would get a piece of it. But it is, it's a pretty low number. It's an indie film number, 100 bucks a day or something like that. And she's being, she's acting like an indie film actress. But, she didn't even fucking show. Like, the drama behind making this movie, she was fired, he brought her back. There's a sex scene. She has to have a four-way with uh, three other people. And The only scene in the film that she was actually qualified to act <laughs> in, in my opinion. <laughs> Airtight! <And> she, <laughs> she wouldn't come out of the trailer. Uh, she wouldn't know. get naked. She wouldn't take her robe off. She was hiding in the closet on the set. So Paul Schrader, the director had to convince her to get naked on the film by stripping off his own clothes and got naked so she would feel more comfortable in order to get her to do this scene. And it's an old director trick, one that I'd never use, but it, uh, <laughs> but it worked. She actually, like, she was like, oh my God, you're naked, and then she went for it, and they did, like, it's, the article sets up really nicely. It's all about, we gotta get this scene, and it looks like they're gonna fire her again and shit like that. Yeah. He shows his wiener, and suddenly she's like, let's do this. <laughs> Well, wieners always have been an inspiration to <laughs> Lindsay Lohan, in, uh, in all fairness. Uh, they also mentioned the fact that she was out partying with Lady Gaga until 5.30 a.m. when she had a 6 o'clock a.m. call for on the shoot. She did get fired early on in the shoot, and when they told her she was fired, she started banging on hotel doors where Paul Schrader, the director, was staying until she found him. Meaning that she went from door to door and pounded on doors at He didn't answer the door. He texted in the her, morning. Lindsay, go home. Yeah. And she stood outside his hotel room bawling so loudly that he heard her. And he said for about 45 minutes before she finally went away. So we brought in a piece of tape tonight. Uh, this is actual sound from the set of her rehearsing a scene with this porn actor, James Dean, that she was working with. And Paul Schrader's trying to direct the scene, and she keeps stepping over him and trying to direct this porn actor into how he's supposed to do the scene. Until the end, if you listen closely to this audio clip, you'll hear him say, I'm tired. <laughs> Let's call it a day. He actually gives up directing because she's so <laughs> brutal. Here's a little piece of audio. And action rehearsal. What shall I say? No, but can you do it? Please, James. Stay your line as you're walking over. Because we're doing rehearsal with the lights. Are we actually staying on the line? Do your job. Until you started talking about it. I didn't say anything as you just walked over. Right. Do your job. All right. I'm mad, but I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. All right. We're going to clear the set. Let's clear the set and go home. Oh, yeah. That's just like the director. Everybody, take five. The director's depressed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kim Kardashian, while we're in the realm. Sorry. Fuck tape Kim Kardashian. Is also in the news now that she's got uh, the spawn of Kanye inside her. <laughs> she's got her own segment as well. Kim Kardashian this week actually turned down $3 million. I know it's not like her, but there's a reason behind it. She was offered $3 million by an overseas tabloid to, coup, uh, to give them the first exclusive pictures of the spawn that comes from mingling Kanye West and her loins. The Kanye? The Kanye, yes. The Kimye, if you will. And she turned it down. Now, Kanye West people are saying it's because Kanye doesn't want to exploit his child. <laughs> Other sources are saying they're holding out for more money. Yeah, that's what I think it was. Three million? What are you, crazy? That's apparently the stand that uh, her mom, Chris, her momager, is saying that we're not going to settle for three million dollars for a photograph of my grandchild. We're going to hold out. I happen to think that that is a more likely story because just this week, Kim and Kanye moved into a brand new home in Bel Air, California. It's a, it's, a, it's a cozy little love cottage for a young couple that is raising a brand new baby. It's got everything you need. It's got a movie theater, a hair and makeup salon, a bowling alley, two pools, and a complete gym. It is 10,000 square feet. 
and it cost them the sum of eleven million dollars to move in. Fuck this yeah! Who did they buy the house from? Uh, no word, but her their neighbor is Jennifer Aniston. They're gonna be friends. Oh, stop it! <laughs> Fuck you! I'll be there for you. <laughs> While Kim is spending eleven million dollars on a mansion, yes, uh, Chloe, her sister, is having a garage sale. <laughs> Just goes to show you the discrepancy in the Kardashian family. She's on eBay selling her old underwear. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. Stop it. I don't care who it is. That's hot. Uh, Chloe is selling uh, clothes out of her wardrobe. Now, it claims on the eBay site that a portion of the proceeds will go towards a cancer charity. Yeah, I know how this family works. Every, for every dollar going to a kid with cancer, $99 <laughs> will go to the Chloe Kardashian Froyo Fund. Uh, Is that what they're going to name the kid? <laughs> uh, she's uh, Such items as a silk bathrobe that she's used. A used silk bathrobe is going up for auction. A used sports bra you can buy if you're so inclined. This was my favorite, however. Let's get a shot of this item up on, uh, uh, on eBay. It's the Khloe Kardashian black yoga pants. These are used, ladies and gentlemen. I don't think you want anything that Khloe Kardashian has sweated in. These pants... These pants were white, it says in the description, before Chloe started <laughs> using them. Is uh, she also auctioning off her laser crossbow? I believe she is, yes. And, uh, and uh, the backpack that she carried C-3PO around <laughs> it. Justin like, Bieber, as we mentioned, is in the news for doing a nice thing for a girl with cancer. However, he didn't do a nice thing to his bodyguard. It's another lawsuit. Uh, Moisha Benabo is the name of the former bodyguard of Justin Bieber. He is a former Israeli soldier who claims that before Bieber fired him, he beat him up. <laughs> he beat up Jason Bieber? No, Justin Bieber. Jason Bieber could do it. <laughs> but That's his little brother. One day I'll be famous like Justin. Justin Bieber, he claims, beat him up in an altercation before he fired him. This guy's an Israeli soldier. I was going to say, no wonder he fired him. He's like, I beat you up. Uh, he said before they called it quits, uh, the Bebenator <laughs> yelled at him and punched him repeatedly in the chest. <laughs> Which I can only envision as like Montgomery Burns from The Simpsons <laughs> punching you in the chest. Smithers. Moshe. You do good burns. That Thank good. you. Yeah, well done. Uh, this guy's suing $420,000 in unpaid overtime. That's what he wants. Uh, Justin settle. says he's just suing. He's just saying, that, making this claim because he wants to settle the money quicker than later. But if you're, I don't care how much money you need, you don't admit that Justin Bieber beat you up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You try to get a job next, but you better ask for more than 400000 because you'll never get another <laughs> fucking right. job. Uh, it says here that you worked previously with uh, Jason Bieber. I'm sorry, Justin Bieber. <laughs> And that he beat you up before he let you go. <laughs> All right, welcome aboard. <laughs> More lawsuit news. Donald Trump is suing Bill Maher, the comedian. Bill Maher went Remember on the that joke. Uh, Bill Maher went on the Tonight Show and said uh, regarding Justin, uh, Justin, Donald Trump. <laughs> Donald Trump, remember, made that offer to Obama, $5 million. If you show us your birth certificate, I will give you $5 million to give to your charity. Your favorite charity, yeah. Uh, Bill Maher went on the Tonight Show with Jane Leno and said, I will give uh, Donald Trump $5 million if he proves that his mother didn't fuck an orangutan to have him. <laughs> That's what he said? That's I didn't know said. that. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. So Donald Trump this week released his birth certificate. <laughs> Proving that his father was indeed not an orangutan and is now saying, you owe me five million dollars. Seriously. Yeah, he said he was going to sue Bill Maher if he doesn't pay up. I thought Bill Maher was the one that was like, somebody else said something where he's just like, I, I'll, I'll pay, uh, I'll, I'll donate five million dollars to Obama's favorite charity if he reveals his birth certificate. And who was the person that said, hey, fucking Donald, I'll give you $5 million to let me put my balls in your mouth. <laughs> yeah. Who was that? I can't hear you. Colbert. Colbert, yes, Stephen yes. Colbert. That yeah. made me laugh so hard. Yeah, uh, Bill Maher just wanted to know that he wasn't the product of a woman and an orangutan. That's the thing. Bill Maher is not nearly as clever as fucking Stephen Colbert because Stephen Colbert left himself. He, you can't sue him or anything like that because right. he's just like, I'll pay you $5 million, put my balls in your mouth. The only way he gets that $5 million if he's like, okay. Uh, but here, all I'll he has goggle to your balls. <laughs> Teabag me. 
I would. Uh, we need some of this press, though. That's what I'm saying. So we have to make an offer, I think, tonight for five million dollars to, uh, to, uh, to 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 Trump to do something. Yeah, but do something that he can never do. Right. Because what he did was offer him something like prove that he did. His mom didn't fuck an orangutan. He's like, yeah. I did. Give me my money. Yeah. Like he took it seriously. We have to find something that he can never. We reach. will pay Donald Trump five million dollars if he lets us fuck his comb over. Okay, I'll do you one better. All right. We will pay Donald Trump five million if he can swallow all of Liam Neeson's cock. <laughs> all right, fair enough. See, that one requires Liam Neeson to say yes. See? Third party, we're off the hook. I'm smarter than Bill Maher. You are. Uh, Spawn of Satan Tadoff Switler is in the news this week. The devil's daughter has allegedly broken up with Harry Styles of One Direction. Oh, is that where that dude's from? I kept seeing his name all the time. Harry Styles is a member of One Direction, very popular boy band out of the UK. How long have they been dating? Uh, a couple months. Very, very uh, publicly. They've been seen everywhere together, and now it's all over. The, the, the reason, though, to me is interesting. Harry claims, this is according to RadarOnline.com, the gossip site, it's because she won't put out. The fuck out of here. Yeah. <laughs> he is, how old is this kid? He's 18. She's 22. That is my favorite quote in the world, yeah. man. <laughs> Nobody says that anymore. That's something you say in high school with your friends, like, she don't put out. This guy's fucking famous. He's like, you know what? She don't put out. Look, if you're 18 in a boy band and you're getting all kinds of pussy and you end up with a 22-year-old, you figure, cha-ching, um, that's it. She's a cougar compared. And she's like, you are never, ever, ever getting in my pussy. Yeah. <laughs> they broke up, according to one source, and this is my favorite quote, Taylor is so concerned that the public will think she's a whore because she dates around. So she doesn't put out. What she doesn't get is that guys keep dumping her because she's being a prude. <laughs> oh my God, I'm so surprised. I'm surprised guys are dumping me because I won't spread my legs. She's like got that surprised look on her face when she wins awards. I, I can imagine uh, somebody of that who's that fucking uh, beloved, uh, revered and shit, fans everywhere. Sex, they, you don't need sex at that point because you're just like, I'm loved by the entire fucking world except for Ralph Garman. Yeah. Um, <laughs> keep your fucking sex, Harry, one direction. One erection. No, you didn't. I just went there. Uh, well, Harry's in trouble because apparently Taylor's heading back into the studio this week, which means <laughs> <laughs> there's a fucking song in, in, in her chamber with your name on it, Harry. <laughs> I too put out just not to you, and sometimes I use a vibrator. <laughs> More relationship news. Charlie Sheen has a new girlfriend. I know this may come as a shock, but she is an adult film actress. <laughs> the 47-year-old star. Kind of like fucking one step forward, two steps back for Charlie Sheen, yeah. isn't it? I'll give you a check for your dead kid's funeral. Porn stars, <laughs> goddesses, tiger blood, winning. She is a 24-year-old porn star named Georgia Jones. See Georgia she, Jones? See what she did there? Yeah, a little yeah, play. Yeah. She has made over 100 movies since getting in the business in 2007. Slacker. <laughs> if nothing else, she's, she's got a work ethic. I have to give her that. Um, she was seen at Charlie's Mexican nightclub. He owns a nightclub in Mexico. The guy's like one step away from a blow dealer. He is just he's this far. He's just, he's an onion, so many layers. <laughs> he's deep. <laughs> if you're not familiar with George, you may want to check out some of her work, like uh, Naughty Nannies, which I can recommend. Um, Cuties in Captivity. That's a little. Oh, the guy went, oh. Yeah. <laughs> now he knows who we're talking about. Thumbs down. <laughs> Lesbian Riding School. These titles suck, dude. Like, where's cock in my mouth? That's what I like to well, read. Well, she does mostly girl-on-girl -girl porn, so but also bondage porn and cosplay porn. No. Yeah. <laughs> She'll dress up as, like, a female superhero and stuff, and then... <laughs> oh. This exists? Yeah, there's a lot of bondage porn that involves female superheroes being powerless. I don't want and... bondage, man. I want to see a chick dressed like Wonder Woman going, like... Just sucking her own tit, no, man. Usually it's a power play thing where the girl gets tied up and she's like a damsel in distress, but she's a superhero in a costume, or she is overpowering the bad guy and tying him up and doing things to him. Uh. Come on, that's hot. I, I'm the bondage angle you can keep, man. It's enough that she shows up dressed like that. I want shit. Power Girl to tie me up and smother her in her giant Kryptonian tits. <laughs> 
Kryptonian tits. Yeah. That's the name of my new film that's coming out, The Kryptonian Tits. I hope you all go out to see it. Uh, she's also in Finger Looking Good 6. That's a good title. That's a good, yeah. By the way, see Finger Looking Good 1 through 5 before you <laughs> jump into 6, or you'll be fucking lost. You know why? Because in the first Finger Looking Good, uh, Jason is the killer. <laughs> that's right. And then it's his mother. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you Won't Escape This Time, Honey. That's that another sounds, one of her films. That sounds fucking scary. Uh, not as much as Nice Girls Are Easy, to tie and gag. <laughs> I'm losing my erection, Ralph. Masks and capes and ropes and gags. Another one of her films. It came back and went down again. <laughs> and nymphetamine. It's kind of cute. I bet that's Charlie's favorite. <laughs> Anything with etamine in it and a nymph, he's very popular. Uh, more talentless slut news. Pamela Anderson had to leave America to find work. She was over in the UK doing one of their reality shows called Dancing on Ice. It's like, it's like Dancing with the Stars, only, well, as you can imagine, on ice. Uh, she's ice skating. She was the first person voted off this week when she, uh, her tits fell out of her costume. No! Yeah. We got a little picture of uh, Pam being dipped by her partner. and then. Oh, crap, man. I had no idea she had cyborg nipples. What is that? What's uh, going apparently on Apparently it's a pasty. I guess she knew they were coming out, so she dressed them up. Oh, yeah, it looks like Dr. Theopolis on Twicky's chest. <laughs> I'm the only person in this room who got that. That's why I did it for you. Biggie, biggie. Beat it, beat it. <laughs> Come on, Twinkie. Beat it, beat it, beat it. Gee, Buck. <laughs> um, there's, somebody's going to laugh at that someplace. Right? I'm looking at them. What the fuck? He's, he's got it. He's got it. Wow, you're good, man. Wow. Uh, when she was being voted off, she said to the host of the show, my dress came off, my boobs fell out. It happens. <laughs> if you're Pam Anderson, it happens a whole lot. I like it. She's zen. You know, we love the big cocks here on the, uh, the Hollywood Babylon show. So do those three ladies. Yeah. <laughs> Don Johnson did an interview with Rolling Stone this week, which addressed the rumors of his monster cock. I didn't know there were rumors. Apparently he uh, has one of the biggest cocks in Hollywood. Or Was so he they what, say. the Liam Neeson of his day or I something? I think he was. Um, he told Rolling Stone that he's not that big, he said. He says, I know because I've seen a lot of big dicks, he said. Please tell me the next line is in my mouth. No. No? Let me read you the quote. Look, I've seen guys with a lot bigger dicks than me. One time I was in the Celtics locker room talking to Larry Bird and Kevin McHale, and there's Dennis Johnson coming out of the showers, and dude... That's who put the Johnson in Johnson. I mean, it must have shown on my face because when I turned back to Larry Bird, he looked at me and said, I know, huh? <laughs> the hick from French Lick was looking at Johnson's cock. So strange. Uh, real quick, this is a Hollywood Babylon warning to everyone in the audience and listening at home. Look out for short people. They're fucking turning on us. Two stories this week about uh, midgets going nuts. I wish uh, Brad, uh, Brad uh, Williams, who, who sometimes sits in here on, the, on the, uh, the Babylon, was here because he maybe he could explain it. But in Norwich, uh, England, in the UK, two Oompa Loompas attacked a man this week. What? <laughs> two men dressed as Oompa Loompas. All right, so not the real legit, like... No, not the real ones, Kevin. <laughs> From Willie's Chocolate Factory. I didn't mean real. I meant I thought there was like 80-year-old little people no. who were like, I haven't had a job in years. These are two midgets with orange faces and green hair and striped fucking parachute pants attacked a 28-year-old man in Norwich in, in the UK. Uh, he was leaving a kebab house, as you're wont to do. You've had yourself a nice kebab. And you walk in the parking lot, and the next thing you know, two fucking Oompa Loompas are beating the shit out of you. Where is it? England? Norwich, yeah. I was yeah. just eating a kebab and then I got skewered. There I am, enjoying my kebab. And the next thing you know, I hear, Oompa, Oompa, Oompa dee doo. We're going to kick the shit out of you. <laughs> what do you get when you walk to your car? <laughs> Kicked in the teeth and they fly really far. 
Two men with uh, painted orange faces, dyed green hair, <laughs> and striped pants, as in the 1971 film, attacked the 28-year-old normal-sized guy. The victim suffered cuts and black eyes. Police are appealing for witnesses. That's my favorite part of the story. If you saw two Oompa Loompas beating the shit out of a guy in a parking lot, I think you'd fucking call the police. No, I'd be like... <laughs> taking video? Oh, the whole time. Good day, sir. You get nothing, sir. <laughs> You stole fizzy lifting drinks. You got the shit kicked out of you by two Oompa Loompas. Good day, sir. But I want an Oompa Loompa, Daddy. I want one now. Oh, you'll get one. No, you don't, my love, because they beat the shit out of you. <laughs> Why do you think they did it? You think they were just sitting around drunk? They're like, Give it to me now. <laughs> Do you think they were just sitting there going, let's dress up like Oompas and go beat the fuck out of somebody? I think they're tired of being oppressed. That's what it is. Wonka's got them in there stirring that fucking chocolate 24 hours a day. They're fighting for their rights, man. <laughs> and it's, it's international. It's happening everywhere. In, in uh, Australia, in Victoria, a 37-year-old man was attacked by Smurfs. A man in Pasco Vale in Victoria, in Australia, 37-year-old man was at a convenience store. He walked into the parking lot, and a Smurf came up to him and asked him for a cigarette. <laughs> the man gave him a cigarette. He said, look, man. Wait, wait, wait. Was it jokey Smurf? Because then it would blow up in his face. <laughs> the guy was trying to do what he asked. Yeah. He gave him a cigarette. He didn't want any trouble, man. Look, I grew up in Philadelphia in a very blue neighborhood, and you don't mess with them. <laughs> Look out for the blues, man. <laughs> and then the guy said, light it before you give it to me. This was Cranky Smurf, I'm guessing. <laughs> the guy refused to do that. Next thing you know, he was jumped by two other Smurfs. Police, <laughs> Police are asking once again for witnesses of anyone who saw three Smurfs beating a guy up in a parking lot. But this time, they've got footage from the convenience store. Shit you not, that's actual footage of the guys who beat the guy up. How do they know those are Smurfs and not Krishna? <laughs> or Dr. Manhattan. Yeah, good yeah. point, man. Well, we don't see any wieners, so it can't be Dr. Manhattan. That's true. Was the guy's name Gargamel by any chance? No, I believe it was not. I was going to say good for them. Very exciting news for me, personally, because uh, David Bowie's coming out of retirement. <laughs> oh, no. You guy has not Bowie. been seen from or heard from in 10 years. Hasn't released any new music. This week, he surprises everybody on his birthday by dropping a new single called Where Are We Now? He has said that that's the first single from his new album, which will be coming out in March. I brought a little piece of the video in, if anybody's a David Bowie fan like I am. If this is quintessential David Bowie. It's a video featuring him as one of the heads of a conjoined twin stuffed animal in front of a screen that is showing footage of Berlin from the 70s. And he repeats the same lyric over and over again. Dave's off his meds. <laughs> Here's a little piece of the, the new uh, song called Where Are We Now by David Bowie. Where are we now? Where are we now? <laughs> oh, fuck. That's as creepy as those two little twin girls from The Shining. Yeah, that's creepy as shit. Uh, Bowie had this statement he made about uh, his new video and new album. It's called The Next Day. It'll be released in March. Uh, he doesn't talk to the press, but we were able to talk to him and ask him if he had anything to say about his new album. This is what Bowie had to say. I've got a brand new album. I've got a brand new album. I've got a brand new album In March a brand new album It's not the same old album This is a brand new album I just wanted to give you a chance to touch yourself yeah, again. Thank you. I was yeah. like so late in the show. Thanks. And while we're talking about uh, new music, this 
fuck this fucking guy. The guy who wrote Friday for, Jess, for Rebecca Black. And he wrote that Thanksgiving song for that other little can't girl. Can't be hateful, gotta be grateful. <laughs> can't be hateful, gotta be grateful. He's at it again. How do we stop this guy? He's got two 10-year-old girls who have started a new rap act called Tween Chronic. I think I've smoked that brand. Yeah, man. I bet you have. They've got a new single that was just released this week called Skip Rope. And it's a, na a new dance craze they're trying to get started. These two 10-year-old girls are a black and white rap duo. And they teach you how to do a new dance called the Skip Rope. It's, it's, it's fucking horrible. But I got to show it to you. So here's a little video of the new uh, song Skip Rope by Tween Chronic. Tween Chronic. Allison and Stacy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, we're going to teach you how to skip rope. So grab your rope and let's do the skip rope. Stop it. I don't know much about the rap world, but they're still shooting each other, aren't they? Can, can you make requests? Is there some sort of beef going on between these 10-year-old girls and some East Coast 10-year-old girls? Well, that was a scary one, man. It's a SEAL Team 6. <laughs> yeah, really, double tapping you out. Yeah. Good one, sir. Let's get the Oompa Loompas on that case. They're about the right size. Yeah, truly. What do you get when you sing bad, bad rap? <laughs> Every week, Kevin and I like to look at the geek news because we are geeks. It's a segment we call The Geek News. Ruff and Kevin, Ruff and Kevin, Ruff and Kevin. Geek News. <laughs> this week, everyone on the internet was talking about this guy who took all the faces of the five actors who have played Batman. Adam West, Michael Keaton, Val Kilmer, George Clooney, and Christian Bale, and then morphed them into one face. And they thought this would end up being the perfect Bruce Wayne. This would be the guy who looks most like Batman. You take the best of everything everybody has to offer, and they give you the, the ultimate Batman. Here's the picture they ended up with. I would so fuck this guy. I don't know. I, if, he was at, if he was Bruce Wayne... Oh, I would so be his Robin. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? You get what I'm saying? You there? would take his Bruce Bane. Yes. Let him give you a little Bruce Bane. I would say to the Bat Cave, meaning my asshole. <laughs> After you slid down the Bat Pole. So that was dick. that was the big news, and then uh, it, it sparked off a whole uh, series of people doing the same thing, like the James Bond franchise. I didn't see this. Yeah. Uh, they, they, there was a guy who took the six James Bond actors and morphed them all together and ended up with this guy. <laughs> <laughs> who looks like James Bond's accountant. <laughs> he looks like a little like Roy Scheider in jo Jaws 2, you know? Yeah, he looks... Heisenberg. So a lot of people weren't happy with this, so they took the same actors and they morphed them again. And then this is what they ended up with. That's better, right? I would so fuck that guy. It's kind of like an etch sketch just, just shake it up and go again. Uh, this week, Superman was seen flying up and down the California coast. I don't know if you heard about this. No. Or not. It became big news. Uh, there were some guys riding a bicycle down the Pacific Coast Highway here in California. They were off by the shore in Dana Point, and they saw Superman flying by. I'm not shitting you. Can you imagine riding your bicycle, and suddenly the man in steel goes zooming by you? It turns out they stopped their bikes and pulled out the cameras and started shooting it. It turned out it was a life-size Superman remote control flying toy. The a Superman drone? Yes, that this guy had built. It's like the robots from the, from uh, the Fortress, Fortress of Solitude. Solitude. Yeah. Ah! This guy was flying this Superman drone up and down the coast, freaking people out. So these guys filmed it with their cameras, and they put it up on YouTube, and it's become a phenomenon this week. But here's some actual footage of this guy flying his RC Superman, and it looks amazing. <laughs> Look who's that! Oh, my God, dude. Imagine if you saw that, riding your bicycle? I believe a man can fly. Oh, 
That is fucking awesome. Right now, Zack Snyder's going, fuck. <laughs> yeah. I spent $40 million on special effects. I could have hired that guy. <laughs> or there's some people by the beach who are like, save us, Superman! <laughs> Superman, come back! Why don't you do it? You won't help us. <laughs> My house is on fire? You fucking <laughs> cocksucker. You Kryptonian cock. <laughs> Uh, while we're talking about superheroes, it's been announced this week that Honey Boo Boo is going to be animated into a superhero. No. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I have another shot. Where did this come from? Snuck in. It's like magic. Michael Troy and the team at Blue Water Productions have announced that Alana Thompson, a.k.a. Honey Boo Boo, has always wanted to be a real superhero, and now the pageant star's wish is to about to become true. Holy fuck. Yeah, they're going to do a 15-minute featurette, an animated featurette that will be seen on iTunes, Kindle, and other digital outlets, but it's Honey Boo Boo as an animated superhero. Here is the... Uh, the Honey Boo Boo's dad in the crowd. <laughs> yeah. This is the cover of the, uh, the featurette. It's going to be a comic book and an animated feature. Here she is. Essential that doesn't even look like her. Honey Boo Boo. Well, no, because she has a waist. <laughs> and all of her teeth. Uh, like any superhero, she has a weakness. Vegetables, apparently. <laughs> we'll bring her down. I don't understand the Honey Boo Boo phenomenon. I don't get it. But the most recent special they just aired on, um, what's it called? The Freak Show Network? TLC, uh, over three million people watched the, the special. How many? Three million people. Three million. Yeah. I thought you said billion. I was no, like, no. what the fuck? Three million people. Three million. Which well. for basic cable is it's huge. Yeah, huge. It's yeah. And uh, lastly, in geek news. Oh, this is my fucking favorite thing of the week. Story. This is so good. Go. There's a law here in the United States of America that if you can raise 25,000 signatures on a petition... The president has to look at your fucking petition. Or the White House. The White House, yeah. Maybe, maybe not Barack It himself. might not go in front of Obama, but the White House has to treat uh, it seriously. I'm a little busy. Um, <laughs> but it has to go to the White House, and they have to evaluate your petition. Well, some wiseacres got, it under, got a bee in their bonnet, as you were. To be fair, let's set up some of the petitions they've done. One recently most people know is there was a petition that's like, turn the Westboro Baptist Church uh, uh, into a hate organization. Uh, recognize right. or acknowledge them as a hate organization. That another was one, the one. Another one is get uh, Piers Morgan deported from America because he has a strong stand on gun control. On gun control. They got like 100,000 signatures on that petition, by the way. And this one was some people got together and had a petition saying Barack Obama, our president, must consider building the Star Wars Death Star for America. <laughs> They had a date, too. It was by 2016, right. start construction. That was the, the goal star. date. Start construction by 2016. <laughs> so 25,000 people who live in their parents' basements were able to sign this petition. <laughs> and it went to the White House. And they have to, it's the law. They have to consider this. So God bless the Obama administration. They responded this week to this petition. Paul Shawcross, Paul Shawcross is his name. He's the chief of the Science and Space Branch of the White House Office of Management and Budget. This fucker has better things to do. <laughs> but he took time out of his busy day this to respond. This is your tax dollars at work, He man. responded to the petition. This is the official White House stand on this petition. Are you doing the whole thing or just highlights? I'm going to do uh, the, well, the, big, the, big, the big responses. Okay. The administration shares your desire for job creation and a strong national defense, <laughs> he said in the beginning of his statement. <laughs> But a Death Star is not on the horizon <laughs> for the following three reasons. One, construction of a Death Star has been estimated to cost more than $850 quadrillion. <laughs> this administration is working hard to reduce the deficit, not expand it. Two, the administration does not support blowing up planets. <laughs> And the best reason of all. Number three, why would we spend countless taxpayer dollars on a Death Star with a fundamental flaw that can be exploited by a one-man starship? I am so glad I voted for the Obama administration, man. 
You were never going to get that from Mitt Romney. No way. No. He'd be like, yeah, fuck yeah, we're building it. Yeah. I am Mitt Vader. I find your lack of Mormonism disturbing. Before we go home tonight. Is it really that time? Holy shit, yeah. yeah we've oh, been... fuck it, we're running late. There's another show that's got to yeah, come in. Before exactly. we do that, can I just quick give a quick shout out? We, you know, we sell shirts here and shit like that. We're starting a new thing this week that we're going to institute for every live show, not just here at the Lovitz, but when we go on the road and stuff. Um, we're working with this great company online called Shirt Punch. They're amazing. They do they, for 24 hours. They put these new, three new designs every day up. You got 24 hours to buy it, then the shirt disappears forever and stuff. We did one this week for the Wayne Foundation charity, a I fat man on Batman it's shirt. Great. It's pretty, pretty dope great. and yeah. stuff. Um, from now on, Shirt Punch is helping us out. Every episode of Hollywood Babylon Live, whenever you come to it, there's going to be a different shirt available that's just available at that show, marked for that show, and then fucking gone forever. So before you head out, there's somewhere around here. Take a peek if you can. The new shirt tonight is uh, me boozing, saying, I want you in the Garmy. A la Uncle Sam, and uh, it, yeah, it, it's it's, it's great. really so, attractive, so man. So if you get a chance, we only I think we only made like 50 of them, so they'll yeah. go like quick. Before we go home, though, there is a musical question that we need to ask that we ask at the end of every episode of Hollywood Babylon. Oh, we can't help but wonder how big is Liam Neeson's cock. You good folks, keep going to NeesonCock.com and adding your facts about the size of Liam Neeson's cock. We do appreciate it. It's a real website, I swear. Here are tonight's... <laughs> Liam Neeson's cock is so big... <laughs> ...that we actually did go over the fiscal cliff, but we were able to climb back up his shaft. <laughs> Not many people know nice. that. Yeah. Liam Neeson's cock is so big... <laughs> Kanye West and Kim Kardashian just paid him $11 million to move into it. It's got a bowling alley and a hair salon. There's a lot of room in there. Liam Neeson's cock is so big. How big is it? The green Power Ranger uses his flute to summon it. Wow. That was good, Strong. man. I haven't heard that in a while. Liam Neeson's cock is so big. How big is it? That even the NRA has proclaimed it's a weapon that should be banned. And they don't ban anything. No, no. Liam Neeson's cock is so big. How big is it? It's replacing the Jersey Shore. Not the TV show, the actual Jersey Shore. <laughs> That's cute. Liam Neeson's cock is so big. How big is it? Even if you don't build it, he will still come. <laughs> <laughs> Liam Neeson's cock is so big. His Rice Krispies don't go snap, crackle, and pop. They just sit there in the bowl saying, did you see how fucking big his cock is? <laughs> <laughs> Liam Neeson's cock is so big. How big is it? Its talentless child was given a recording contract and a movie deal. Oh, I fucking hate that. <laughs> and lastly, Liam Neeson's cock is so big. That in the end, Charlie did the right thing and gave it back to Mr. Wonka instead of selling it to Mr. Slugworth. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of Hollywood, have you had a good time this evening? As always, we thank you so much for coming out and spending your Saturday evening with us. Give it up for Mr. Babble himself, Ralph Garman, man. And my surprisingly straight friend, Mr. Kevin Smith. And that is Hollywood Babylon for this week. I'm Kevin Smith. I'm Ralph Garman. Babble the fuck off. Good night, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Kevin Smith and Ralph Garman. Hollywood Babylon, live at the Lovitz.